Hi, everybody. Thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. It's uh, such a special time to be able to connect with uh, friends. Uh, even though we can't see each other, uh, we can talk and connect to each other. And um, I want to welcome you. I, it is a privilege to talk about the triumph of the human spirit, specifically in times like this that we are all looking for inspiring stories. And I hope the story of the Ava will uh, give you a little bit of uh, inspiration and the uh, hope that if you believe it, it is no dream and we will, and the human spirit will prevail. So um, I want to get started with uh, introducing the Arava and uh, maybe show you a map. Um, but before we'll start, uh, for, for those of you who are tuning in from your computer, uh, it is best if you'll uh, tune in to, uh, get to speaker's view and not gallery view. It will be more uh, helpful for you uh, to see properly. So Sandra Ova is actually um, the frontier of Israel. It is located halfway between uh, Be'er Sheva and Elat, deep down in the Negev uh, desert, right along the Jordanian border. Actually, the beautiful hills that you see right now is the view from the greenhouses overlooking the mountains of Jordan. Uh, for those of you who haven't traveled to this region, uh, this is the largest border in Israel that has no physical fence. There is no physical barrier between Israel and Jordan and the people and the communities are the guardians of the land in this region. Uh, this community uh, is set on 6% of the land of Israel, 6% of the land of Israel, uh, but only 1,000 1, families are currently living in the Arava in seven communities. The distance, by the way, between the northest and the southest community in the Arava is an hour drive. That's pretty much the distance between Tel Aviv and Haifa. Just think about how many people are living between Tel Aviv and Haifa, and then the 1,000 families in the Arava. And uh, the reason is that, that this is an area of multiple challenges. First of all, um, we live in a desert. It means that the climate is pretty extreme. It's around 10, uh, 10 o'clock at night here in the Arava. It's, uh, it's been a relatively, um, nice day so it's only 113 right now uh, you can imagine how noon looked like so climate here is pretty harsh especially in the summertime but temperature fluctuates between winter and summer this is a desert between day and night and the climate here is pretty extreme uh, the second challenge that uh, we are facing is of course the proximity to the jordanian border especially these days that uh, there, are, there are a lot of talks about sovereignty, a lot of talks about uh, the peace negotiation with Jordan and a lot of questions regarding what's gonna happen in the Middle East. Uh, and we are a border community living on the border and it brings a lot of questions to the table. And uh, the third challenge is water. We live in a desert, but uh, we're not connected to the main water grid of Israel. We actually take all the water that we use here from a huge aquifer that lies underneath the Arava, and we have more than 55 water wells, and we dig, dig deep down into the ground and take water from those wells. Uh, and of course, we are pretty geographically isolated. Uh, it is, uh, the nearest city is more than two, a two-hour drive. It might, it might sound uh, very, um, close to the average American, but in Israel, which is a six hour drive from the one end to another, it's like a third of the country on a very bad road. So we're pretty much isolated, um, which by the way, now during COVID uh, time is actually proving to be quite an advantage. Uh, so hopefully the virus will stay out of this region. It's too hot for it. So that's what we're counting on. Uh, Anyhow, so with that in mind, the water challenges and the other challenges that uh, I've laid down, uh, obviously this region without water and uh, proper soil is leading Israel's agricultural industry. Uh, this community of 600 farms is producing more than 50% of Israel fresh vegetable exports. We're actually too big for the Israeli market. And we had the privilege of supplying is all of Israel's um, agricultural uh, needs 
during recent uh, COVID crisis where uh, markets were closed down and we were privileged to assist a lot of families in needs with the products that we produce here in the Arava. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that from nothing, from a desert, we produce more than the state of Israel can actually take in. So we export most of our production. And we take a lot of pride in that matter. Actually, when you hear talks about Israel's famous ag world-renowned agriculture abroad, you'll mainly hear a lot of people talking about the Negev, which is surprising, and the Arava. Uh, but this is the triumph of the human spirit. And to take over the desert, that's probably one of the best triumphs that you can do. Uh, we grow here dates, we grow zucchinis, melons, peppers, watermelons. Uh, and lots of other uh, crops, uh, vegetables, and fruits that we've been able to uh, acclimate to this region with the help of a lot of knowledge. Because what we lack in natural resources, we compensate with human spirit. And I like to say to people that, you know, to take a piece of desert and to turn it into a blossoming garden, it takes a lot of chutzpah. For the first pioneers to step in into an empty desert and say, this is where Israel is going to be growing most of its agricultural production. It takes vision, it takes knowledge, and it takes a certain attitude and a pioneer spirit that I think a lot of the people here possess. And that's the secret, this secret ingredient to the a success of this region. But um, if we're looking at to the agricultural su success of this region, what we can understand and learn that um, we are actually answering uh, on two very important questions or global challenges that a lot of countries are now facing. A lot of countries are now facing with serious food security issues, meaning to supply good, good food, good quality food in good enough quantities to feed the world's population which is, by the way, growing in an exponential rate. And a lot of people in the future will not have something to eat since the world uh, resources are diluting and we will not have enough food for the growing population. And on the other hand, desertification, it means that the land that once was fertile is no longer like that. The desert is taking over available land. And not only that we have m more mouths to feed, we have less natural resources. Now for us, the pioneers in the desert, uh, having nothing, no land, desert, and no resources, that has been the baseline ever since this region was founded 60 years ago. So the knowledge that we have accumulated here uh, is very valuable. And this knowledge is not only kept in this region, but we share that knowledge uh, because we believe that other countries need it. Uh, and I think um, one of the best examples is a special school that we have here in the region, which is called ACAT, Arva International Center for Agriculture Training. Together with JNF, uh, this school was founded uh, 26 years ago to empower students from developing countries to study agriculture, but in a practical way, a non-academic way that will really um, give them the tools to go back and uh, help their communities. For the past 26 years, we've had more than 30,000 alumni, students from more than 20 different countries in Asia and in Africa, even countries that has no diplomatic relationship with the state of Israel, like Indonesia, and Gambia, both Muslim countries uh, with no connections to Israel, and other countries like Thailand and Laos and Vietnam and East Timor and India and so many other countries <coughs> that are based on agriculture. More than 70% of their economy is based on agriculture, yet the agriculture that they have in their countries is very traditional. And we see a lot of um, importance in giving these students that are all coming from universities in their origin countries, we want to give them the tools to go back to their communities and change everything. And we do that with the help of the Jewish National Fund who is supporting this program. This program is all about giving them uh, the tools to fish. 
give them the hook not the fish itself because we believe in empowering people we believe in planting the seeds we are farmers after all so planting the seeds and teaching somebody to grow their own food is far more sustainable than giving them a bag of rice um, more importantly than the agricultural knowledge that we give the students and we do give them uh, in our beautiful gnf campus we give them uh, lessons about agriculture and about food security and plant protection and water management and econo economic skills and marketing skills and even how to present powerpoint presentation to their bank manager so they can get a loan because we know that in today's world a farmer is also an entrepreneur, is a business person, and we want to empower them with the entire change of supply and not just the green fingers. We know that the best part of schools is the practical training, and these students are not just going to an academic campus. These students, that by the way, 30% of them are women. Think about young women from these developing countries, women in their 20s that are leaving their countries probably for the first time and going to a foreign country, which most of them have heard only negative things in the news. What kind of courage does it take? Uh, in this program, we are actually allocating the students to farms. The students are living in the farms with the farmers. Uh, my, I myself have three students that are living in the farm, in my farm together with me, they are from Thailand, and they work with the farmers. And farmers like my husband are their mentors because we know that the best learning comes from working every day, practicing agriculture in the fields with people that are encountering challenges on a daily basis. And the alpha farmers are not just entrepreneurs, they are scientists, and they are business people, and they are agronomists, and everything together, because this is what it takes to succeed here in the desert. And what we provide them more than the training part is the attitude, and that's the most important part. By the way, as part of the training uh, at ACAT, at our school, we take them to tours around Israel. We take them to the Galilee, we take them to the Golan Heights, we take them to Bethlehem, we take them to Jerusalem, we take them to Yad Vashem, we show them what the Jewish people and the Israelis are all about. They live in our communities, they live in our farms. By living with us, they get the best lesson that they will get, which is, if you will it, it is no dream. This is a win-win-win program for our students, the best gift that you can give somebody is the knowledge to change their lives. And if the corona crisis have taught us anything, is that the ones who be creative, the ones who think outside of the box, the ones that will have the courage to change things, those are the people who will prevail. And this is the attitude that they, we inspire into our students because these, these are the best tools that they will be able to get. So for the students, um, you can understand for yourself what it means to empower people and especially women, young women in today's world. For the farmers, this is a huge help out in the farm in a community of 4,000 people where you don't have a lot of working hands and your main income relies on help working in the farm, it means a lot. It means that there are more people who can help me put food on my, my family's table, and this is a very valuable help. And for the State of Israel, this Tikkun Olam project generates the best ambassadors you will ever get for the State of Israel, because they have been here. They know what a Shabbat dinner is. They know what a Jewish family is. They know Tikkun Olam values. They know. We don't teach them. We don't teach politics. We don't teach, we don't do PR. They just understand it by living with us and seeing what we give them. This is the win-win-win circle that we are generating here together with the Jewish National Fund in a pure Tikkun Olam project. And to us, agriculture has no borders. We don't differentiate between our students, the countries that we work with, 
for us, everybody is entitled to an equal opportunity, no matter what the background you come from. This is the story of the pioneers who built Israel that came from different places, with different backgrounds, with different abilities. And this is what we, uh, be, this is the way we look at our students and at our community. And I wanna add with maybe the best uh, lesson that the students will get in the school. And maybe it's um, the story of Israel and the story of the Ava. You know, 10 years ago, we've started a master program together with Jewish National Fund to change the face of the Ava and rebuild the community to attract many young families to the region. And together we have built a medical center and we have built an emergency response center. We've built an entirely new community that was led by a separate society group by the name of Tsukim, an entirely different town that emerges from the desert just because people thought it's a good idea. And the best thing, by the way, with working with JNF is that they're crazy and we are crazy. You can come up with them with the craziest idea and they'll go along with you. So it's a perfect match. But our students are seeing that in 10 years, you can build an infrastructure for an entire generation to come and live in a place that is desolated land. And what they're seeing is that you can take a piece of desert and turn it into a farm. You can take a desert and turn it into a kindergarten, into a community. And we have done that in a very short time. And we see the fruits maybe the vegetables in our case, right here in the Alva. And this is what our students are seeing. If you put your heart and soul into something and you've got the best partners in the world, you bring together a group of people that believe in something, you can make things happen. And I'll end maybe with the best success story that we've had on the, in my view, because there are so many great success stories, but uh, this is my favorite. So um, we have uh, graduates from Nepal that have um, studied here during the big earthquake that have hit Nepal in 2014. And they've stayed over with us for two executive years and we gave them extra tools because they had a huge task uh, ahead of them, which is to rebuild their country. These are students from Nepal. <clears throat> These students went back to Nepal, one of the poorest countries on earth, eh, with a concept that every person is only responsible for its direct families. And these students, having spent time in the Ava, have built a kibbutz, a literally a cooperative farm in Nepal that is set on the most modern um, principles of farming. They've negotiated with American companies to buy tractors. They went to, buy, to banks and got loans. The best modern farm, it is called by the way, the Arava Nepal Modern Agricultural Company. And people put money in a special basket that is designated to provide knowledge to all the farmers in the area. And every year, more and more of our graduates are joining that cooperative that is all, not all about the commercial aspect, but is also teaching farmers from other places how to farm because they believe in giving back to the community because this is what they've learned in the Arava. And to me, the most, one of the most emotional moments was before we said goodbye to these students, knowing that this is what they had in mind, and by the way, we have, we have more than 150 graduates working at this cooperative. They told me that the best lesson that they've learned was in Yad Vashem, because they have visited Yad Vashem prior to the earthquake. And once the earthquake hit their countries, their leader told them, you know what? We are in the best place on earth to study because these people have lost their people but rose from the ashes and made the desert bloom. So we don't have the privilege of crying. We have the privilege of learning from these people. And it was us, the Arava people, the privilege of giving them to the tools. So just a taste of how one can change the world just by planting seeds of knowledge, of hope, and of human spirit. 
And that's the triumph of the human spirit in my eyes, the story of the Arava, how the story of the Arava is Im impacting other countries and other people around the world. And by the way, this program is exposing Israel to more than 1,000 students annually through the universities that we work with. Uh, it, it's kind of like the BDS, but the other way around, a good perspective on Israel, understanding what exactly do we do. <clears throat> so for us, uh, this is the best way to advocate uh, for the Arava and for Israel. And everything that I told you comes from a community of less than 4,000 people in the frontier of Israel in a place that a lot of people have not heard of before uh, we really present it. So to me, that's an example of what Israel is all about, that example of what the Arava is all about, and that's a great example of the triumph of the human spirit. And that's a wrap for me. That was absolutely amazing, Noah. Thank you so much, Yasher Koach, for your very warm and uplifting presentation. I am Elise Golden Berkeley, the Jewish National Fund President for Greater Los Angeles. I would like to quickly acknowledge and thank our wonderful WFI leadership, the WFI Chair, Sarah Cannon, Sapphire Co-Chairs, Francis Bilak and Dina Singer, and High Society co-chairs Betsy Rosenthal and Maureen Shapiro. I also just want to make a comment about Noah's presentation. Uh, the Arava is so special to me. But what is one of the better, what are the moving points that matter about the Jewish National Fund is that we are there to answer the call. My dear friend Noah, if I can, please share this story. When Noah got pregnant with her first child, the closest hospital was two hours away. Mm. This is a woman stuck in the tuchus of the universe, pardon me, no offense. <laughs> and, there, and in order for her to get the prenatal treatments and pediatric treatment that she needs, she has to travel at least two hours away. And then the Jewish National Fund heard of that dilemma. And now because of situations such that Noah had to endure, which by the way, two weeks before her due date, was she in the Arava waiting to give birth? No, Noah had to go move back home with her mom for two weeks in Tel Aviv so that she knows she is close to a medical facility. You and I don't have to put up with this. Here in the United States, go to Tarzana, go to Cedars, go to UCLA. You don't have a problem having a facility, but they did in the ROI. And I'm so proud to be a part of the organization that made it convenient and easy for Noah to have two more children and maybe not done yet. So. I'm delighted that that's what we are able to accomplish. We've just listened to Noah's life's experience in the Arava and the obstacles that she and the other pioneers face. Together, we can continue to build our homeland, changing lives for the better. From the Arava Institute, the Arava International Center for Agricultural Training, to water, research and development, technology, Together we are making a difference and are a model for other communities to follow worldwide. We have an opportunity to make a difference today, right here, right now, by making your 2020 annual gift. Together, we are the Jewish National Fund. Without you, there is no organization, no task forces, no growth. It is up to us to make a difference. If you have already made your annual gift, we sincerely thank you. If you would like to give more, by all means, pledge away. If you have not yet had the opportunity to make your gift, please consider doing so by either clicking on the link that we have so conveniently placed in the chat, the email that has already been sent to your inbox, or in the text on your smartphone, we are trying to make this as painless as possible. 
we also invite you to join any one of our Women for Israel Giving Societies. We have the major donor Sapphire Society with a minimum annual donation of $5,000. I personally am a big fan of the uh, payment plan, so that could always be set up. With your gift, we present you with this beautiful 14 karat gold necklace that comes with a, um, a teardrop sapphire symbolizing our commitment to water and your commitment to Israel. And we add a diamond for each year that you renew your commitment to Israel. This also includes exclusive access to our major donor events and receptions and puts you at a VIP status while traveling to Israel and opportunities to be on the JNF tax task force and more. Of course, we acknowledge our women who have made the commitment of $100,000 as a circle of sapphire. And we have our circle of sapphire women plus for those who have generously completed their gift of $200,000. And then there's the World Chairman Society for those who have given over $1 million. And I am so proud to announce that Los Angeles has the highest number of world chairmen in the US. And we have some that are on our call. So, so pleased. Another giving level is our high society. For a minimum gift of $1,800, you will receive a beautiful pendant in the shape of our homeland, the state of Israel, as well as invitations to attend high level briefings with Israeli dignitaries and exclusive access to WFI society level events, VIP treatment on JNF's Queen of Sheba, WFI tour, and more. Another option is our Women's Alliance for a minimum contribution of $360, where you will enjoy insider briefings on Israel, educational seminars, as well as recreational and cultural activities, ranging from cooking events to evening with journalists and authors. Whichever society you are comfortable joining, we welcome you with open arms. You can even place this, by the way, on your credit card. You might as well double your points and miles in one day, and we will need them when we travel back to Israel together again. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining us today and for your continued support for Israel and the Jewish National Fund. Together, we are building a mighty nation. Tadalaba. Muted. <laughs> Amazing. Elise, thank you so much. No, we have some questions for you placed in the chat. Um, the first one is, if you could talk about the difference between the Arava and, um, hold on, where is it? Sorry. Well, the Arava is not like any place in Israel. So I can talk about the difference of the Arava to anywhere in Israel because it's pretty much unique. Here it is, the difference between the Arava and the Negev. So the Arava is actually part of the Negev. The Negev comprises 60% of the, of the land of Israel from the area of Beersheba all the way down to Elat. And the Arava is located right in the middle and comprises 6% of the land of Israel. So we are a proud part of the Negev. By the way, for those of you who don't know, uh, in 60% of the land of Israel lives less than 10% of the population. And that's one of the main missions for our region, the Negev, and for Jewish National Fund through programs like Blueprint Negev that is intended to build infrastructures and quality of life projects that bring, can bring people down to the Alva and the Negev. Beautiful, thank you. Another question here from one of our participants. What percentage of agriculture is produced in hot houses and or hydroponics? and who harvested the crops? So uh, that's a very good question. Um, most of the production here is in uh, hot houses or greenhouses, since uh, there is a need of um, controlling the precise conditions within the field. 
So a closed a facility allows us to control climate pests and other measurements. Uh, and the harvest, the planting, everything is done by the people who live here in the region uh, with, with the, the help that we can get. Beautiful. Including the students, by the way, that are giving great help to the farmers here. Um, my apologies, everyone. My name is Lisa Shaul. I'm the Associate Director for the Los Angeles region. Um, here's another question. With so many international students from all over the world, do you have translators and what language, is, what language are the courses in? So that's part of the coolest uh, things about ACAT. Uh, our classes are built according to nationality just because uh, we teach in English. But to each group, we assign a group leader who translates for the students in the origin language of the students. And our group leader is always a graduate of the program. So he's not just serving as a translator, but also uh, as somebody who can uh, adjust the students to the program and a mother or a father that accompany or a big brother or sister that can accompany the students while in Israel. Okay, one more here. Is the R of R working together at all Halutza communities and Ramat Hanegev communities? Are they sharing technology and resources? So uh, in uh, uh, the entire Negev area, there are um, several research and development centers that are supported annually by the Jewish National Fund and the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, they are generating knowledge to assist the farmers in the, re in the Negev region to farm in the Negev with all the multiple challenges that I've uh, explained. And of course, these uh, R&D centers are sharing the knowledge in between them, but you have to understand that even though uh, we are all part of the Negev, the uh, natural conditions in each area, Chalutza, Ramat Negev, and the Arava are very different. Uh, the principles of agriculture are the same. That's why we can teach students from Thailand how to farm because a plant is a plant is a plant. But in terms of professional knowledge, we, sh we share as much as we can, but the difference is pretty vast between the regions, geographically, climate-wise, water-wise, and other very important factors. Um, can you just elaborate on this? What is the tuition cost and how long is the training program? So the training program is a 10 month program. It starts in August when we plant and it takes the students all the way to the end of the season when we clear off the fields and start sanitation. So that why the, that's why it was designed for a 10 month program. In terms of the tuition, uh, we, uh, we um, set a very uh, unique payment system together with the students. For us, the school ACAD is not for revenue causes. It generates jobs in a region that is so far away that uh, it's the biggest employer in the region. So the students are actually getting paid for the practical training that they are doing in the farm. So they can pay their tuition from the salary that they gain from the farmers so actually, they don't need to pay anything before they come to Israel. They, are, they only need to pay an advancement on the flight ticket, and their farmer will take care of everything else. Most of our students are smart enough to save some money so they can go back home with seed money to start their own business. Okay, great. So one more, and I'm going to loop these two, and then we'll, we'll um, close it out. So. This one is, is there a religious community in the Arava and is the Arava a draw for young religious couples? Yes. And then after that, since so many of your products are designed for export, are there any exportation to the United States? I'll start with the second question. Yes, we do export to the United States. Uh, regularly as uh, different products. Uh, if somebody is interested, I can find out exactly uh, where is the nearest Costco that sells dates from the Arava or peppers from the Arava. Uh, we do it during the season, which is winter, around October to April. That's our growth season. Um, so the, the answer is yes. 
And the peak is during Thanksgiving, always. I don't know why you guys are crazy about red peppers for Thanksgiving, but that's apparently the case. Uh, the second question about a religious community, have to tell you, when you live in the desert and there's nothing between you and God, we don't like to be labeled in any way. We are spiritual people just by living in the desert. So it's a mixture of people, you know, secular, religious, we are all pioneers at the end. So everybody who share the same spirit and the same passion for the land and the people and the spirit is welcome here. Can I add something about ACAT? And that is there is a tremendous byproduct with the Institute that not only are they trained to go back home and help their communities and teach other people, but they become Zionists. They go home and they become Israel's ambassadors. And we can't pay for that kind of Hasbara, that kind of publicity. It is amazing what this does, not just professionally, but personally to them. They come home changed completely. It's really very, very touching what they're doing. And the institute that's in the Nepal, by the way, it's also known as a Moshav. There is a Moshav in Nepal, whoever would have thought. Uh, I, I want to thank Elise and add on, you know, um, we teach young people. They're the future of their countries. We are sowing seeds for the future. We know that our graduates will find themselves uh, in the future in high positions, either in the diplomatic staff of their countries, in the business sectors, in the academic world. Those are leaders that we are cultivating. The people who choose to travel all the way to Israel, specifically the ladies, they have a spark in their eyes. They are here despite of all the challenges and we believe in them and we know that they are making a difference and we know that they remember who are the people who gave them that opportunity uh, to start something new. Uh, and we've had a lot of great success stories of people who uh, found themselves uh, in, here in the embassy in Israel and in the government and we hope that by um, by sharing the knowledge and uh, by believing that economic interests will translate politic, we can change also the way Israel is perceived and is treated amongst many other nations. You know, at the end of the day, if Kenya needs Israel's agricultural knowledge because it needs to feed its people, who cares about the politics? We care about the people. And I think that's uh, the important part. And it's also tikkun olam, you know, it's part of our values. We cannot ignore people, you know, uh, not having enough food in countries that we know that they can change their situation. There are countries that people are not growing uh, food near the river, outside the river because they don't even think of the concept of laying down pipes from the river to a faraway place. This is the level of traditional agriculture we deal with. And here in the Alava, you know, farmers are using, uh, using their cell phones more than they're using their hands because we've got these apps and gadgets that are measuring the temperature and the salinity and the humidity. I'm, I'm laughing at my husband's all the time. I'm like, look at the plants, my God, you're looking at, at your cell phone all the time. And he's like, this is more accurate than just, you know, kissing the leaves of the so the difference between the two worlds, it's like, you know, showing your simple farmer a space shuttle. But he needs to see the space shuttle, even if he, he will end up with buying a car, because that's the vision that you set that it will drive him to make that first step. And this is what we are uh, pushing our students to um, change the way they think.